welcome to this Albers deep dive about consumption and happiness in the time of COVID. Let me start with a quick introduction. My name is Matt Isaac. I'm a marketing professor in the Albers School of Business at Seattle University. I'm also a consumer psychologist who's interested in how consumers make judgments and decisions, particularly those that are surprising or seemingly irrational. I've developed an elective course for undergraduate marketing majors at Seattle U called Consumption and Happiness. I've taught this course three times over the past three years, both in person and currently online. In today's talk, I'm going to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on happiness, the impact of COVID-19 on consumption, approaches that firms have taken for marketing during the pandemic, and then I'll end by sharing my perspective on what consumption and happiness might look like in a post-COVID world. Although COVID is obviously a global pandemic, I'll focus primarily on its effects in the United States. Let me start by discussing the effects of COVID-19 on happiness. Of course, in order to explain how COVID has affected happiness levels, it's necessary to define what we mean by happiness. This is, of course, tricky and could be the topic of an entire talk or really an entire course on its own, as philosophers have been struggling with this definition for many years, and there are dozens of definitions out there, ranging from hedonism, which is about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain at each point in time, to eudaimonia, which is a Greek concept that can be loosely translated to represent human flourishing. The Happiness Research Institute, which is an independent think tank examining why some societies are happier than others, such as suggests that there is a cognitive dimension, an affective dimension, um, and a eude eudaimonic dimension of happiness. Most of the measures I'll be talking about today relate to the cognitive dimension of happiness. When measuring happiness, many researchers rely on subjective measurement. Subjective happiness or subjective well being, as it's often known, is typically based on people's self reported responses on a rating scale. A commonly used subjective measure of happiness is Cantrell's self anchoring striving scale, which is devised by the psychologist Hadley Cantrell in the 1960s. The measure, commonly known as Cantrell's ladder, is a simple question in which survey participants imagine being on a ladder numbered from 0 to 10, where the bottom of the ladder represents their worst life and the top represents their best life. Current happiness is assessed by simply asking participants to rate where they stand on the ladder. A similar question can be used to measure expected happiness in the future. Another commonly used measure, uh, aside from Cantrell's ladder, is called the satisfaction with life metric in which participants rate their satisfaction with their life, quote, all things considered and as a whole on a 10-point scale. It may seem hard to believe that such simple self-reported measures really reflect one's happiness, but people's answers to these questions have been shown to correlate with many other indicators of happiness. For example, how happy others perceive someone to be. Importantly, these measures rely on an integrative and reflective assessment of happiness more of a cognitive view of the happiness construct, rather than judgments of feelings or emotions or of momentary pleasure or positive emotion. Furthermore, these measures or similar measures are used by large organizations today to track happiness globally and longitudinally. For example, the Gallup organization has been tracking well-being in the United States since 2008 by conducting at least 500 interviews a day for 355 days, 350 days of every year. Its well-being index uses a composite measure that's based on Cantrell's ladder and combines participants' current happiness and their future happiness ratings. The World Value Survey has been conducted since 1981 to understand people's values and beliefs in almost 100 countries. And the World Happiness Report, shown on the right, is an annual publication from the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. It relies on Cantrell's ladder and other subjective and more objective measures to rank the countries of the world in terms of happiness. It's been, it's been ranking countries in terms of happiness for the past eight years. 
Although not the primary focus of this talk, in case you were wondering, the World Happiness Report in 2020 ranked Finland as the happiest country in the world for the third straight year. It's another example of what's been called Nordic exceptionalism. Nordic countries tend to do very well in this ranking year after year. Many reasons have been suggested for this exceptionalism, including welfare state generosity, low income inequality, autonomy and freedom, and trust in others and social cohesion. Interestingly, the USA ranks 18th on the list of 150 plus countries, which isn't bad, but may seem low given that the US is first in terms of economic indicators such as GDP, gross domestic product. Clearly has been shown in many studies over the years, the correlation between economic and subjective indicators of well-being are imperfect. During COVID, a number of organizations have been closely tracking happiness and producing more frequent reports and updates, some of which I'll sum summarize here. These organizations include a group of health systems, which published a report on the emotional impact of the pandemic, the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, which captures public opinion data uh, from its general social survey and has developed a new COVID response tracking survey as well. So what are all of these reports finding? First, the bad news. Subjective happiness in the US is lower than it has ever been since the, this type of tracking began. The NORC study asked participants to evaluate how things are these days and whether, they, whether people were feeling very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy. The proportion of respondents who reported being very happy has dropped to the lowest levels ever. And the proportion that are not too happy increased to the highest levels since uh, the general social survey was launched in 1972. You can see the very happy uh, line in blue and the sharp drop in 2020, uh, the not too happy uh, line in gray with the uptick in 2020 as well. We can see high levels of unhappiness in a different way using a very interesting tool called the Twitter Hedonometer. Uh, which is a group of, uh, which is something that a group of researchers developed to examine the average happiness score of words that are used in tweets on Twitter each day. It involves a 10% random sample of the 500 million messages posted to the service daily. Each English word is thrown into a virtual bag and assigned a happiness score, usually about 200 million words per day. Through a process that involves some crowdsourcing to quantify the happiness conveyed by every word, researchers are able to calculate an average happiness score for that day's bag of words. Uh, so you can, as you can see here on this graph, this measure is uh, less cognitive and more ac affective. Uh, it's capturing emotions and people's day-to-day -day hedonic experience as expressed in their tweets. Uh, and this graph shows the uh, hedonometer ratings for the past 10 years. Uh, and you can see the big drop in sentiment here in 2020 after the COVID uh, pandemic emerged. If you zoom in a little closer, um, and here this timeline shows rather than the last 10 years, just since 2019, and you can see the hedonometer uh, results for these two years, and you can see the major drop uh, after the COVID pandemic set in, um, and an even steeper drop in the days after uh, uh, George Floyd's death. So if there is any good news that's emerging from uh, this data set, uh, it's that the hedonometer readings have risen since June, uh, although they are still quite low overall. And it's not just current levels of happiness that are down. Americans are exhibiting less optimism for the future than in the past, as shown in these NORC results. The blue line, which captures optimism, is trending down. And the gray line, which captures pessimism for the future, is going up. Again, if there is any good news, it's that the blue line is still higher than the gray. So in spite of everything that has happened in 2020, optimists still outnumber pessimists. Not surprisingly, 
Americans' life stress and other measures of poor emotional health have been on the uptick. This graph from the Consortium of Health Organizations shows that about 55% of Americans are experiencing more life stress than before the pandemic. The same study includes uh, what's known as a pandemic emotional impact scale, which asks participants the extent to which they're suffering from things like insomnia, or feeling down or depressed, or just being bored or unable to concentrate. Not surprisingly, there's an inverse relationship between scores on this pandemic distress index and subjective happiness ratings, as this graph shows. For people who are experiencing more life stress, that is when the orange line is higher, subjective happiness, the green line, is lower. Of course, this means that not everyone is being affected in the same way by the pandemic. This is a graph of subjective happiness by age at a global level from a survey conducted by a team in the UK this summer. You can see that happiness scores using Cantrell's ladder were lowest for young people 16 to 39 and highest for those 60 plus. This is interesting in itself because the older population is more susceptible to severe health problems from contracting COVID. It's also a marked shift from prior research that has documented what's known as a U-curve of happiness throughout the lifespan, where older and younger people are typically happier than those in their middle age. Um, so this shift is a worrisome pattern because it suggests that young people are being affected disproportionately by the pandemic in terms of their happiness. And this is of course troubling given the already high pre-pandemic levels of clinical depression in that group. The NORC study confirms these results showing that younger people are more likely to report psychosomatic symptoms than older Americans. The darker dots on these graphs correspond to young adults aged 18 to 34, and they are further to the right than the lighter dots, which are the older adults, which means that young people are more likely to feel nervous, experience headaches, have trouble sleeping, and so forth since the pandemic began. Although not shown here in terms of gender, there's also some research showing that women have experienced more of these symptoms than men during COVID and have had a slightly larger drop in happiness. Another indicator that everyone has not been affected in the same way by COVID-19 are these graphs from the Brookings Institute think tank and Ipsos on the right, a market research firm. They respectively show that while of course people who have lost a job or income during COVID are less happy than those who haven't, Black Americans who have lost a job, that's the blue dot at the bottom of uh, the graph on the left here, are the least happy. Uh, Black Americans are also the ones who are most concerned about responses to the pandemic being biased against certain groups, as shown in this data on the right. So after showing you all of this bad news in terms of happiness during COVID, I, don't want to, I, I do want to end this section with a few potential silver linings. NORC has now conducted three waves of well-being studies during the pandemic, and the latest numbers released in September uh, 2020 suggest that the mental health issues and emotional problems that rose at the onset of the pandemic have at least stabilized, with self-reports at least showing no growth during the summer. Further, and perhaps most interestingly, there is some work suggesting that a minority of Americans, some put the number at about 20%, are actually feeling better and even happier during the lockdown. Of, co of course, these are likely to be those who have not been as directly impacted medically or financially by the pandemic. A study from Canada, which admittedly is a country that has not been affected quite as much by COVID compared to others, found that 20% of participants felt better than before the pandemic. Anecdotally, this has been attributed to getting away from the day-to-day -day rat race and a reduced feeling of FOMO, fear of missing out, along with more family bonding time, daily walks, etc. At least for some, COVID-19 has led people to discover that their way of life um, prior to COVID was both exhausting and perhaps unnecessary. The next topic in this talk is COVID-19 and consumption. 
And as these graphs show, COVID has clearly had negative effects on the U.S. economy. Gross domestic product in the U.S., which is both a measure of consumption and production, fell dramatically uh, in early 2020. And employment rates, shown on the right, have spiked, although we have seen some signs of recovery there. Importantly, research has shown that while economic indicators are correlated with subjective well-being, they're not always perfectly correlated. That's why, as mentioned earlier, the U.S. ranks first in GDP, but only 18th in subjective well-being. A view of consumer spending slightly different from GDP is the graph on the left, which shows the change in consumer spending from January through September. As you can see, spending dropped dramatically in the spring, but picked up a bit in the summer and now has leveled off a bit. It's still at lower levels than pre-pandemic. The table on the right shows one of the consequences of this change in spending. This is a list of large retailers that have filed for bankruptcy during COVID. There are many others that, that are at risk. Another important leading indicator of consumption is the Consumer Confidence Index. This index is based on a five question survey conducted by the conference board that asks consumers about current business and employment conditions and about their expectations six months into the future. Consumer confidence took a nosedive after the pandemic began, but flattened and even showed some signs of recovery during the summer. Although much higher than uh, 2008 recession levels, the US Consumer Confidence Index is still quite low. You can see that in the graph on the right, which goes all the way through August. It can be helpful to understand how consumer consumption patterns have shifted throughout the different stages of COVID-19. Of course, as you may recall, in the early days of the pandemic, there was a rush of panic buying and hoarding behavior of non-perishables and especially cleaning supplies, including things like toilet paper, paper towels, disinfecting wipes, hand sanitizer, etc. Why did this happen? Psychologist Stephen Taylor at the University of British Columbia suggests that some of these items have become a, quote, conditioned symbol of safety during the pandemic, which causes people to seek them out. It could also be that this type of panic buying occurs because people are not good at forecasting how much they might actually need. Everyone is being told that they need to stay home and stock up for a few weeks, but because many of us don't really think carefully about how much we need, we may be prone to misforecast and buy more than we might, might actually need. And all it takes is for someone in the crowd or maybe a few people who are naturally anxious to overpurchase for others to notice this and see uh, carts uh, stocked with toilet paper. And as social beings, we interpret situations based on how others are reacting. So seeing others hoard products that we think we will need increases concern about scarcity and elevates our need for control. Uh, when experiencing so much uncertainty in the world, people may feel the need to do something to make themselves feel more prepared. And that may lead to this sort of hoarding. As a consumer researcher, it has been very interesting to observe the new consumption trends and patterns that have emerged during COVID-19, many of which seem strange uh, initially, but after some reflection, actually might have been predictable. For example, the graph on the left shows the company Mondelez's revenue decline in Q2 2020. Interestingly, this was driven primarily by a sharp decline in its chewing gum sales. As it turns out, chewing gum is consumed just prior to or while socializing with others. And as people have been stuck at home and social distancing, gum was evidently deemed unnecessary. It's another example of the graph on the right shows that the number of transactions at Starbucks sharply declined since COVID-19 began, but this drop was cushioned by an increase in the average order size as individuals seem to be buying drinks for their entire family um, or those they are quarantined with rather than just for themselves. Starbucks has responded to the pandemic by planning more drive-through and pickup stores and reducing its mall footprint. A final example that received some media attention was Walmart's report um, in April that it was seeing an increase in sales of tops, shirts and blouses, but not bottoms, pants and shorts after people began working from home and relying on video conferencing where only the top half of their body would be shown. 
An important characteristic of consumption during COVID-19 is that it has been uneven. As shown in the graph on the left, which measures expected growth in essential versus non-essential spending, consumers initially responded by deferring non-essential purchases. And these include spending on hobbies, leisure, vacation, and other items that they don't absolutely need. And instead, they focused on essential purchases or personal care. This is directly a consequence of feeling uncertain and um, the riskiness of the situation. However, as the graph on the right shows, during the summer, consumers started coming back and actually purchasing some non-essential, big-ticket, durable items, such as sporting equipment, uh, think treadmills and exercise bikes, uh, and even furniture. Uh, so the, the recovery has been greater for durable goods than for services, uh, obviously things like travel, vacations, heating out, uh, which still remains quite low. The fact that spending has shifted somewhat from services to goods is important uh, in terms of happiness. And that's because there's been considerable research showing that consumers achieve greater happiness when they spend on experiences uh, rather than physical products. And that's not what's happening currently. There has also been uneven impact of COVID-19 on industry sectors and product categories. This is an early graph from April um, showing shifts in spending with the categories on the right seeing more spending and the categories on the left seeing less spending. The size of each circle corresponds to the size of each industry sector. Not a lot of surprises here. For example, food delivery and video games increased as people have been staying home, but movie theaters and airlines have suffered the most for the same reason. This related chart prepared by Facebook and the Boston Consulting Group is also from the early days of COVID and again reflects how some categories have become winners and some categories have been losers. Of course, companies operating in the red uh, industries here have had to pivot or think of creative ways to salvage their revenue streams, especially small businesses who have been hit the hardest. Another example of the uneven impact of COVID is in online versus offline shopping. Across all age groups, uh, people state that they're more likely to shop online than they did prior to COVID-19, uh, and that's shown, shown on the left here. Uh, and as a result, e-commerce sales was up 30% for the first six months of 2020, year over year, as shown in the graph on the right. Uh, so companies like Amazon have seen growth, as well as retailers that offer online ordering, but curbside or uh, store pickup. I also want to mention four other consumer tendencies that have emerged during COVID according to over 250 chief marketing officers in a recent CMO survey. Related to online shopping, consumers are placing more value on digital experiences. They're more con uh, price conscious now. They're more willing to try new products and services, meaning they're showing less brand loyalty. And they're acknowledging and responding to companies' attempts to do good. I'll discuss some of these tendencies more in the next section of the talk where I talk about how marketers have responded to COVID. So given the shifts that we've just discussed in consumer happiness and consumption during COVID, how have marketers and brands responded? Well, some companies have done nothing, and in fact, have pulled back all, almost all of their marketing and, and certainly their advertising. Um, the reasoning being that they're seeing this revenue and profit compression as well as potentially declining marketing budgets. But interestingly, um, that's not universal. Even though marketing budgets are down in absolute terms for large companies, they are actually up relative to other spending and, uh, and relative to firm revenues during COVID. Uh, and this again comes from the CMO survey. So companies seem to realize that they must keep investing in their brand and in consumer retention and communication during these times. And indeed, research from Facebook suggests that consumers are paying attention to how brands respond during this time. Doing nothing is probably not the right approach for most brands. Uh, as you can see here, of people surveyed globally, two and three think that the way a brand responds will impact their likelihood to buy from that brand later. 
And so how have brands responded? At a minimum, we're seeing brands trying to express thanks to first responders and others, or even adapt or change their logos temporarily to stress social distancing or safety precautions during COVID. Retailers have implemented new policies and practices in physical stores to meet governmental regulations and to keep their patrons and employees safe. This effort in doing their part and being a good corporate citizen is probably a good place to start. However, marketers are also being careful so they're not seen as insensitive, uh, trying to just peddle their products and focus on product profits during these difficult times. And that's le led them to walk a bit of a tightrope. Um, and unfortunately, these worries have led some brands to go too far in the opposite direction, uh, playing it too safe in their advertising uh, and making it difficult for their brand to stand out at all or to be remembered. A user video which went viral in April uh, was a supercut of COVID era commercials that all seemed very similar. Part of this may be uh, due to the challenge of actually executing and filming new commercials during COVID, uh, given uh, the limitations in terms of meetings and uh, social distancing rules. Um, and so as a result, we're seeing some very standard production decisions and executions, at least early on. I'm going to share a brief clip of the COVID supercut, and you'll be able to see, I think, pretty quickly how similar the tone, music, and words uh, of these uh, various commercials, which have all been grouped together, uh, really make each advertising spot non-distinguishable from the other. first opened our doors since 1926 since 1978 for 60 years for 75 years for over 80 years in 90 years over 100 years nationwide has been on your side restaurants have always been there for you nissan has been with you through thick and thin we will do what we've always done take care of people we're people 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 and family 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 so that should give you a sense. It's a more than a three minute uh, clip, but you can see a lot of the similarities uh, uh, that were occurring. So um, the global communications firm Edelman came up with a list early on during the pandemic, which I think still uh, resonates. And it was focused on how brands should respond. Um, and it was based on something that they call a trust barometer. They emphasize that brands need to show up rather than going silent, which I've already discussed. They need to be willing to partner with the government, with local communities, even with other brands in order to maximize the effect of their actions. And, uh, and it is true that they have to focus on actions and not just words during this uh, time period. Um, more than ever, they have to focus first on helping solve problems that consumers are facing rather than just trying to sell or pitch their products something I've already also discussed. And, and finally, uh, communications need to convey compassion, but also need to be informative and fact-based. Uh, to these suggestions uh, from Edelman's playbook, I would add the importance of being authentic to the history of one's brand uh, and also supporting one's own employees. Brand activism is more important to consumers than ever before. They're not just buying brands for the products or services they provide, they want brands who are willing to take a stand and who deeply care about the same issues that matter to them. Consumers are also very concerned about how companies are treating their employees at this time, and they want the brands they support to take care of their employees as best as possible uh, during this difficult period. They also want brands to act locally and help the communities in which they are embedded. 
A good example of advertising that generated a lot of attention during COVID and was timely and seemed to be quite different from, from other advertising that was out there. Um, in, and it also related not just uh, COVID, uh, but to the racial injustices that were occurring this summer. Uh, and this is an advertisement, uh, a commercial from Nike. Nike has dealt with some uh, criticism and other marketing efforts, including past issues uh, related to treatment of workers in manufacturing facilities and then has been called hypocritical for other actions. But, but I think no matter your perspective on Nike overall, they did manage to stand out from the pack with their You Can't Stop Us commercial, uh, which was released this summer. And I'll share that with you now. We're never alone. And that is our strength. Because when we're doubted, we'll play as one. When we're held back, we'll go farther and harder. If we're not taken seriously, we'll prove that wrong. And if we don't fit the sport, we'll change the sport. We know things won't always go our way. And the world's sporting events are postponed or canceled. But whatever it is, we'll find a way. And when things aren't fair, we'll come together for change. We have a responsibility to make this world a better place. And no matter how bad it gets, we will always come back stronger. Because nothing can stop what we can do together. Again, this is just in uh, a single commercial, but it reflects Nike's savviness as a marketer, focusing on technical excellence in the commercial by creating a brilliantly edited spot that required hundreds of hours of video footage to be reviewed and spliced together. This gave the commercial a wow factor that led people to share it widely. But it was also consistent with Nike's increased efforts over the past two decades to take a position on social issues and move beyond just being a producer of athletic shoes and apparel. More and more, this is what consumers are expecting from brands. If brands are unwilling to embed themselves into the fabric of consumers' lives, uh, then consumers are showing willingness to try other products and to focus on price, as I showed you in the CMO survey from earlier. So investing in brand building and brand equity during COVID is not just a luxury, uh, it's an imperative for brands to stay relevant. Um, I, I'd like to end this, thought, uh, this talk with a few thoughts about consumption and happiness in a post-COVID world, whenever that may be. First, many have stated that our world has been irreparably transformed by COVID, and there's certainly some truth to this. Uh, just in terms of consumption habits, as this graph from the consulting firm McKinsey shows, many consumers expect the low-touch activities that they have adopted to continue after COVID is over. Many consumers have tried new shopping behaviors or brands and plan to continue that after COVID as well. Indeed, a report from the Boston Consulting Group, another consulting firm showed that crises can lead to long lasting changes in behavior by shifting attitudes. Uh, for example, after 9-11, new long lasting policies were put into place. Uh, after uh, SARS occurred, there was uh, some new consumer behaviors and increased in e-commerce that occurred. So we can identify this in, with many other historical examples. What about subjective well-being or happiness levels after COVID? Will we see a return to pre-COVID happiness levels even if there is a post-COVID recession as many predict? It's hard to know exactly what will happen, especially given the current uncertainty in the world. But I'd like to close this talk with three thoughts about consumption and happiness post-COVID. 
First, when thinking about consumption, it's important to understand and distinguish between postponed, accelerated, or disturbed consumption versus more permanent shifts that reflect new customer realizations about their wants and their needs. Things that they didn't know before COVID. And this point is nicely made uh, in a BCG report as well. This will dictate whether the various consumption shifts I've been discussing are temporary or permanent. Also, even though we have seen some major changes in consumption and human behavior during COVID, habits take some time to form and past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior. And so all things being equal, it seems likely that we are more likely to go back to our old ways than shift to something new. Of course, this may depend on a lot of factors, including whether we have realized new value from our new approaches and things like our age and how long the pandemic causes us to change our ways as the pandemic itself may be forming new habits in us. Finally, in thinking about happiness levels after the pandemic, I would like to mention the notion of hedonic adaptation. There's a lot of evidence that people are surprisingly quick to return to baseline happiness levels, even after extremely positive events, such as winning the lottery, or extremely negative uh, events, such as suffering a debilitating injury. In most ways, COVID has presented an extraordinary negative economic and social challenge for us. But I'm optimistic that hedonic adaptation will allow subjective well-being and potentially consumption to recover more quickly than we might expect. Thank you for your attention and interest in this deep dive. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or comments. Thank you.